Welcome everyone to today's program. I am Kathy Brett with Becker's Healthcare. The program will begin with a presentation and we will have a question and answer session following completion of the presentation. You can submit any questions you have throughout the presentation by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. Our presenter will attempt to answer as many questions as he can during the time we have and will follow up on questions he does not have the opportunity to address. You will receive an email within about a week following the webinar that will include instructions for how you can download a copy of the presentation. You will also receive a follow-up email shortly after completion of the program. You can submit your feedback or any additional questions at that time. This email will not include the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce Charles Lauer to you who will introduce today's presenter. Mr. Lauer was the publisher of Modern Healthcare for more than 30 years, taking it from a monthly money losing proposition when Crane Communications purchased the magazine in 1976 to the nation's leading healthcare news weekly. Known throughout the healthcare industry and beyond as a leader, Chuck Lauer is now a healthcare consultant, an author, public speaker, and award-winning businessman who is in demand for his motivational messages to top companies nationwide. Chuck, we are honored to have you with us today. And I'm honored to be able to introduce Quint Studer, one of the true visionaries in healthcare who I have admired for so many years. By background, Quint Studer spent 10 years as a teacher before entering the healthcare industry in 1984 as a community relations representative. From then until he founded Studer Group in 2000, he served as department director, vice president, and senior vice president at a number of organizations and as president of Baptist Hospital in Pensacola, Florida. Each of these experiences built a platform for creating tools and techniques and systems aimed at improving organizational performance and most importantly, patient care. A recipient of the 2010 Valcom Baldrige National Quality Award, Studer Group implements evidence-based leadership systems that help clients attain and sustain outstanding results in more than 800 hospitals and organizations across the U.S. Together, they serve as a national learning lab in which best practices are harvested, tested, refined, and shared with all healthcare organizations through peer-reviewed journal articles, student group publications, and products designed to accelerate change. Now, Quint has written six books. His latest book, which I have read, The Great Employee Handbook, is geared toward employees at all levels. It just hit the shelves and is already getting rave reviews. Quint remains in the field creating tools and techniques designed to make organizations and the people working within those organizations the best they can be. What a privilege to be able to welcome Quint Studer. Well, thank you very much, Chuck, and um, it's a, maybe a mutual admiration society. Chuck was one of our very early inductees into the Studer Group Hall of Fame at our national What's Right in Healthcare conference, and, and Chuck well-deserved honor, and we appreciate you staying, staying in the field. What you didn't mention, of course, is what a tremendous hockey player you also are, but that's probably for another um, conversation. And speaking of also um, modern healthcare, of course, we're pleased to co-sponsor the great places to work. And, I think it's so appropriate to discuss that when we're going to be talking about employee engagement that we do have that. I also want to thank Becker Healthcare. Um, from the very beginning, Becker Healthcare has been nothing but great to me and the Studer Group in helping us carrying our, our messages to really impact a wide array of audience, which is which we are doing today. Um, as I looked at our list of, from Medical University of South Carolina to Advocate to Allegiant to Indiana Health, Averis, Integra, Covenant, Freighter, Ministry, Nemours, Sherman, Sutter, Vanderbilt, and others. Um, so many great organizations that already do a good job in employee engagement. So it's no surprise that the, the good always want to 
get better. I'll never forget when I was president of Baptist Hospital, I asked if they did any leadership training. And I, I said they did, and they showed me the module, which was pretty impressive. And then I went to the first training session, and um, out of all the 100 or so leaders that should have been there, there was only about 14 that showed up. And those actually were the 14 that really were probably the best. And I wondered where the other were, and of course it was optional. So I'm a big believer in training has to be mandatory. But So no surprise when I went over the number, hundreds of people that are on this um, call that many of them already truly, truly get it. So what I'd like to do today is lay some foundation and then give some practical tips. What's really different today than when I started this journey at, way back at Holy Cross Hospital in 1993 when we were trying to figure this thing out and almost at default we ended up asking the employees what they thought only after we did a number of other strategies. We saw the connection back there between our employees feeling better and all of a sudden a whole bunch of things getting better from financial to market share to quality to service. And then of course it was basically anecdotal. It'd be a few case studies and so on. And Kathy, if you go to the next slide please, I think what our, our people will be able to see today is that really we've gone from anecdotal information to just an abundance of research. So what I'm going to do today is talk about some research. Then I'm going to give some things that aren't on the slides. As I went over the slides, I, I thought there were some foundation steps that I need to tell everybody in, in the um, group about that. I call it a human responsibility that if we see a problem and there's a solution, we provide those solutions to people. And I think we can go to employee engagement, but if we don't do a few things first, we just won't sustain the gain. What we have seen in, in the recent years is as we're getting a lot of attention in this, is that you just can't ignore the employee. And people might think, well, we never did. But research shows over the years that may, maybe we have thought we could do this by maybe missing the employee, whether it's even today lean or some other process improvement um, that we're very, you know, win the Malcolm Baldrige Award without being good in process improvement. You, you still can't find a, a buzzword or a new process or a new technique technique if you really don't engage the employees. And I also want to talk to the C-suite out there, because when I'm talking about engaging employees, that means, of course, not only engaging yourself, but engaging your leadership team. Because in essence, we're all employees. When I wrote my book, The Great Employee Handbook, I pointed out the fact that really we're all employees. And Grant Savage is a, a good friend of mine. I used to serve on the board with him in the AUPHA until he went off the board. I'm, I'm still on it. He's at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And they did a study there that was published in February of 2011, which is on your screen, that was really talking about leadership, rework, and workarounds. And what they did, and if you know Grant, they're very peer, pure research oriented, and they really wanted to see is how much did employee engagement impact a couple areas. One was workarounds, and the other one was patient safety. And I think what's remarkable about this study is when, you know, it's common sense, but now you have research that shows if you're a more highly engaged employee, it was more likely to fix things. So if you're in the process right now with us having to make a 20% cut in expenses probably over the next eight to nine years, unless we can improve revenue significantly, which I don't think we can, we're going to have to make things a heck of a lot better, which means all of us are going to be looking at reinventing what we do. To reinvent what we do, we're going to have to change processes. To change processes, what we're seeing here is we're going to need an employed, engaged, engaged, employed, employee, excuse me, an engaged employee base. An engaged employee, um, it's like a tongue twister for a guy like me with a speech impediment, um, really means that they are taking ownership. So an engaged employee will fix something. A non-engaged employee will work around it. So what this shows is the higher employee engagement you have, the less workarounds, which means the better processes you're fixing. The other thing it showed in his work is a patient safety link, that people were more engaged, had better quality of clinical outcomes. So right off the bat, we have research. Now, though we don't want to overwhelm you with slides, let me just verbally go through some other research. In January of this year, the Harvard Business Review published a whole entire the whole entire magazine was based on happy employees equal return on investment. I'd encourage our listeners to read it. The voluntary hospital 
um, Association came out with a study that showed that there's a correlation, again, between employee engagement and such things, social mortality, and length of stay. And I think this ties into Grant Savage's and UAB's research. A more engaged employee is going to work better to own something, which will end up improving processes, which reduces length of stay, and also then an uh, engaged employee is going to handle a handoff or a handover better, which is going to improve clinical outcomes. Our work at Studer Group always shows the same thing, because we do a lot of research. What I'm trying to say to set the tone is our goal has to be to improve clinical outcomes. If our goal is to improve clinical outcomes, then we have to have employee engagement. I bring that up because one of the things I still hear, and if you haven't gotten my latest insight, it was went out under Becky Kennedy, or please go to our website and read my latest website called if, if it's soft, why is it so hard? One of the things I, I find in healthcare is senior executives specifically will say something to me in a group like, well, are these soft skills? And, and I really want, if we're going to improve healthcare, we've got to wipe the idea that engaging people is soft. I personally think that the, what's happened over the years is people that find it hard call it soft so they can say they're doing the hard stuff and not get to the soft stuff when the soft stuff is, I think, really, really hard. So for example, I was in an organization recently and they said, Quint, do you believe in this or something soft like culture? And I said, well, you're, according to your HCAPs, your management of pain puts you in the 22nd percentile. Your side effects of medication, you're in about the 30th percentile. Your nurse, nurse communication is like in the 50th percentile. People understand their discharge instructions is like the 20th percentile. I said, you're a good organization, so, so you claim. You do a lot of advertising. And I said, if you were really, if this was soft and clinical outcomes and patient care was important to you, wouldn't you have already been doing it so you would end up having a better patient perception than you do? So none of these things are soft. So my message right now is research backs up what I'm going to talk about. And as importantly, we have to guide it into clinical outcomes. So no matter what changes happen in the external environment in healthcare, we're going to have to make sure that we have an engaged and aligned employee workforce that either can move proactively, such as you know, those that we've been working with for years have been eliminating readmissions for better discharge planning and better post-visit phone calls, or reactive which means all of a sudden I realize that if I put in a good post-call system and do better discharge planning, I can greatly reduce clinical outcomes. So it either has to be proactive or reactive, but, but it has to happen. By the way, because we do so much work in the readmission field, we have found in our phone calls to patients when they leave a hospital that one of the challenges with readmissions, which research has showed recently, is 50% of the people that end up readmitted to the ED have never followed up with their doctor's appointment. So these are one things that patient phone calls do. So let me go in before I go to the slides, some basic elements that you have to put in place early on. Number one is the evaluation tool. When we go to organizations and they say that employee engagement is important, when we pull up the way the leader is being evaluated, is employee engagement on their evaluation, number one, and is it have a weight that will force those that are not doing a good job to do a good job? We find many times that an evaluation tool really doesn't have employee engagement. Now, many of them might have turnover or agency, but those are really not that important right now because of the financial conditions people aren't making job changes. So turnovers, unless you're in a, again, you have to look at your own environment, is pretty much becoming irrelevant. People are just sort of unhappily staying where they're at until, the fine, until they can sell their home. So employee engagement becomes a bigger element. So my question to ask yourself as the listeners is, if you pulled up your evaluation of your of the managers and supervisors, would employee engagement be on their evaluation? Next is, can, have you trained your managers and everyone to answer tough questions? If you've heard us talk or you've looked at our work from our 100 plus people that are out in the field all the time, you know that we find that if people aren't prepared 
for employee engagement, they won't do it. And one of the diff most difficult things is the tough question. And if you go to our website, you will find a lot of homework that you can do on how to do this. An example is, if I go to engage an employee, and then the employee asks me a question, and I don't know how to answer it, I'm either going to not want to go out there again, or I'm going to do a we they, which means I'm going to be well liked, but the senior leadership isn't. And once again, you lose employee engagement if they don't believe in who the leader, senior leaders of the organization is. So really quickly is, do you have the evaluation tools, employee engagement on it, and to what weight? Again, weight should vary depending on the leader. Have you trained all your leaders on how to handle tough questions? The toughest questions you're going to get today is how come we're spending money and we're tight on expenses? You, you told me we, we, we've got to lower our amount of FTEs or amount of workers here. We're having a reduction in force, but I see you're buying a lot of physician practices. How are you doing that? I don't understand. If we don't have money, how are we doing this? You're saying we, we have to not have overtime because we've got to watch expenses yet you're doing an aggressive marketing campaign. I don't understand. And I have found most leaders don't, aren't prepared to answer those questions. I'm not saying that organizations shouldn't recruit docs. We're all for it. I'm not saying they should market. We believe in it. We're just saying that you've got to be able to explain to the employee why. Or you end up in the we, they. And of course, there's foundation elements that every leader needs, because if you don't they can't run a meeting, that they can't do finances, they really will not have time to spend the time they need in employee engagement. So Kathy, why don't we go to the next slide? So if there's one quick thing, if you're going to walk out of this presentation with, it's this. Though we're going to get a little more complicated as we go on, this is really the key. We have found, and Studer Group is as guilty as this as anyone for our first 10 years, that we are so have so little time in healthcare. We sort of have to move quickly that we'll tell somebody what to do, and we'll tell somebody how to do it, but we won't spend the time telling people why. An example is hourly rounding. We were the first company in the country to research falls in a way that looked at how often a patient was rounded on, and of course we printed peer review articles on American Journal of Nursing on round falls. Of course, I'll go to many times when I speak around the country, or we have excellent speakers at Studer Group, all of us as we, we speak. I would put mine in the excellent category. They're better than me. But um, we'll have people come up to us, and one of them, nurses, came up to me one day and said, well, thank you. Because of you, I have to see the patients every hour now. And, and I think they were frustrated. How I got so much task on my plate. How do I do it? And I went over the research on falls and infections, they say, you know, if somebody would explain why, we would, we would be doing this. And so I think to hold the mirror up and say, before we tell people what to do and how to do it, we really have to explain why. Our research that we do called Straight A Leadership Assessment shows that 31% of frontline supervisors today think they can stay the same, and the results over the next five years will either be the same, better, or much better. Well, we know that's not true. So if we don't explain why, we need them to move quicker with more urgency, we won't get the what and how. And truly what we're looking at is we're looking for compliance. We're looking for consistency. If we have to cut cost, which Studer Group works with a lot of organizations on cost reduction done the right way so you don't lose the employee's passion, you've got to do it in a way so people understand why. So my message here is when we communicate, start the why, the what, and the how. Kathy? Next slide, please. This is a, a new book Chuck was nice enough to comment on. And I wrote this book as the companion piece for hardwiring excellence, except I wrote it for every employee in the organization. Because over the 12 years I've been on the road, employees have really come up to me and said, you know, ask me questions. What do you do with a gossipy coworker? What do you do about confidentiality? You know, how do I work better with my boss? What do you do with a difficult customer? So I wrote this book um, in that regard. And I also wrote it thinking of healthcare workers in mind, because I know they can be skeptical and not want to be preached to. So the book was written sort of going with the Harvard Business Review research that shows an engaged employee feels that their company invests in them. 
So I wrote a book so when every employee in the organization gets it, they'll say to their boss, thank you very much for caring about me. Gee, this book has been really, really helpful. So I hope our listeners have a chance to take a look at this because I think if every employee read it, we'd have a lot better culture and organizations to work with. Kathy, next slide. What I want to do now is talk about diagnosing, and then I'm going to show you some top practices. Kathy, next slide. One of the things we have found in healthcare is people are so busy to do something that they sometimes don't spend enough time in the diagnosis. And we, we're guilty using our stuff. You know, people read hardwiring excellence and they went out and they started rounding, but possibly didn't know exactly what they were looking for. Or they just overwhelmed the organizations with thank you notes. And people were losing productivity because they were so busy right, re opening thank you notes. Um, and, and not to put those things down, it's just that sometimes you've got to spend a little more upfront time diagnosing, whether it be physician engagement, which the student group is heavily involved in in physician integration now, patient, or you have to look at um, the employee. We don't want to paint such a wide brush. So the first thing we always recommend is a diagnosis. Um, there's various ways to do that. Here's the most common one. Kathy, you want to hit the next slide? This is Studer Group. In the era of transparency, this is Studer Group's actual employee evaluation. Now, we're very lucky, we are employee at an engagement survey. We were ranked the um, fifth best place in the United States to work last year. We also compare ourselves to the 90th percentile, where most consulting firms compare themselves to the 60th. So when you look at this, we compare ourselves to the 90th percentile. What I mean by this is this allows a leader to basically look at their diagnosis for their own and say, where do I want to focus? So it doesn't mean that I will I want to learn what I do best and what I can do better. It also shows how I compare to the other departments in the organization and also how I compare to the 90th percentile. Now, most organizations can't use the 90th percentile, but they can certainly use the goal that they have. Kathy, you want to hit the next slide? This also will help you see the difference between supervision and, and senior leaders. So if a supervisor is ranked much higher than a senior leader, then you've got a we, they. But it allows me to dig into a tool and say, where do I need to focus on? Kathy, the next slide. So this will go all the way through. And, and what we normally find with, with ours is, of course, we're a fast-moving company. It's normally things like work balance. It's normally things like, um, you know, with the travel, with what's going on. We have people on the road all the time. There's work difficulty. If we can get travel better and so on. But it allows us to look. Now, if you look at this one, it says, I have a clear picture of the future direction of the student group. This survey was done at the exact time that the student group was going through some, I think, some very positive changes. And even though we we're still ranked in the 90th percentile, we now know that our workforce needed to feel better about some of the changes we were making um, with the direction of our company, which meant taking on investors. Um, and if we did this now this year, I think they'd be very confident. But it just shows us exactly where you need to focus. When I was at Baptist Hospital, for example, we saw right away that we had challenges in certain departments more than others. So I bring this up because I think this is the tool that needs to be utilized, but most organizations I find don't utilize it well, don't roll it out, and don't keep it in front of people. Kathy, the next slide. So here's the final survey, and I'll show you that the student group once again was in the 90 third percentile. We had 98% response rate, and we're the 99th actual percentile of all organizations around the country. But it still always shows us where we can improve and, of course, um, where we, we need to go. And it's sort of neat to see that it's what an average engaged employee. I, I bring this up because I think it shows that we eat our own cooking here at the Studer Group. Kathy, next slide. Um, we have a free toolkit on our website. If you go to our website, we have an entire toolkit that you can download for free in how to roll out the employee engagement rollout process to make sure that everybody gets the results and sees the diagnosis and has a work plan. So I'm not going to go over this, except you can get it off our website. Kathy, next slide. 
I think this is the secret sauce of Studer Group. It's making sure we validate what's supposed to be done happens. So what we do when somebody, when we roll out the employee engagement survey, is every employee gets this form. When they get this form, they fill it out as their manager is rolling out the survey. Then they actually can either go online and do it anonymously, or they put it in an envelope and return it anonymously. But we know the department. We already know, did you get the information in an open manner? Was you given, were you given an opportunity for feedback? Discussed and prioritized next steps? Action by the leader or senior leader? I believe this is the missing tool in most employee engagement rollouts. Because I know when I go up to somebody and say, how'd the rollout go? No leader is going to say, well, you know, it was pretty lousy. You can tell by my scores I'm not good in communication, so what do you expect? They're probably going to say, hey, it went fine, went good, and so on. What this tool does, it allows us to see how many people are actually getting the survey rolled out so we can intervene if not enough people are hearing it. We also know exactly how they're, what they're saying about their supervisor rollout, and it also allows us to coach the supervisor in the process. Also on our website, is a mini employee pulse check you can do throughout the year because we're a big believer that you don't wait till the end of the year to do a diagnosis. You continuously monitor the situation because in healthcare things can change rather quickly. Kathy, next slide. This is again research and we appreciate our friends from Kaiser Permanente allowing us to show this. This shows frequency. This is an organization that really spends a lot of time on data, and I admire them, them so much. Um, nobody does better data or research, we find, than Kaiser. What they did is they wanted to look at frequency or rounding. And this is what I'm going to talk about next, and I like showing research. They found that if a physician, they have a lot of employed physician, and staff are rounded on at least monthly, their satisfaction is in the 87th percent. If they're rounded on quarterly, it's in the 79th percentile. And then after that, it really drops down to the 50th percentile. This was 8,700 employees. So you can see those that were talked to the most also were the most satisfied. Kathy, next slide. So let's talk a little bit about rounding, because if there's only one thing that works, it's, it's rounding, especially if you want to have it on your evaluation, because that forces the leader to actually do it with the frequency. Know how to answer the tough questions, and three, knows to avoid we-they comments, such as let me research it, let me study it. First of all, we want to tell the staff about rounding. We're surprised, you know, people just start doing this change of behavior, and the staff is all of a sudden thinking, don't you trust me? What's wrong? What's happening? So tell the staff research shows that employee engage, engage employee, that you're going to be a better organization. And as a leader, you want to make sure you're listening better. Tell them why you're going to round, that you want to make sure systems are working, that they have tools and equipment to do the job, that you understand better the barriers that are in place, that you're looking for solutions. In my book, Great Employee Handbook, my message to employees is don't wear your leaders out with problems. Motivate your leaders by bringing them solutions. We're going to talk about um, you know, people to recognize, including physicians. So you really want to talk about why we're doing it. We're probably going to round at different frequencies depending on how many people we have in direct reports. And don't assume because you talk to somebody every day you've had an engaged conversation. This is where we're really going to take a little bit of time to get some feedback. We're going to use the rounding log. And people will say, well, why the rounding log? And I'll explain that in a few seconds. And of course, we, we want to get feedback on what we're learning, because really what we're judged on is responsiveness. I was talking to Dr. George Ford yesterday in San, from San Antonio, who's probably the national expert on physician burnout. One of the things he talks about is how physicians get so frustrated with administration, basically over the responsiveness. Kathy, next slide. So please don't take this so literally. I'll have people say, Quinn, I've been rounding for four years. Can I ask some different questions? I, I would hope so. Um, at M Memorial Healthcare in, in Fort Lauderdale, Frank Zacco, one of the things they're focused in on is patient safety. So one of the questions they'll always ask is, in a patient care area, is there anything going on that could be harmful to a patient? Don't assume I know. If we're putting in a new software tool, I'm going to ask how it's working. If we change the process, I'm going to ask what they need to know. So my message here is always 
make sure these aren't cookie cutters, that these are adjusted to your organization. So we always want to know and connect with somebody, at least about their family. We want to ask them what's working well. Trust me, healthcare people tend to lean toward what's wrong instead of what's right. Ask yourself when you walk into a unit, are you more likely to hear what's wrong or what's right? Make sure you know what people to recognize so you can carry that reward and recognition. Look for systems that need to be improved because that frustrates people if they don't have good working systems. Make sure they have tools and equipment to do the job and if they don't, figure out why they can't get them and explain it to them. People understand and know better than we're, we're looking for, we're seeing it, and we're studying it when we really aren't going to be able to get it. And make sure we follow up. And that's what Kathy's going to show now with the rounding log. Next slide, please. The rounding log, and you can create your own. This is the one we use. The rounding log basically helps a leader by employee sort of track what's going on. Were there safety issues? If we're looking at the external environment, we can add that what systems improve, staff member. We really want to track these because we want to make sure we see if things are just repeated. Um, I was in an organization one time and it seemed laundry was getting repeated all the time. That means you need to go fix the laundry question. Also, we want to harvest those tough questions and feed those up to the senior leaders so we can understand better what are the tools and techniques that our managers need to be, be get, getting so they can be better armed when they go out and talk to the, the employees? And of course, we always want to look at barriers and reward and recognition. Kathy, next slide. The next tool, of course, after rounding, which is I care about you and I'm fixing systems, is reward and recognition. Um, I wrote a, a personal note the other day to a woman named Donna Kirby. And I sent it to her, and I just got an email today from her telling me how much it meant to her. Now, I could have said it, but it was amazing how it resonated when I wrote it. We have many things, many things in our toolkit at Student Group website and our National Learning Lab on this. The main thing we want to do is make sure it's authentic. Does it have to be handwritten? No. It can be typed if it's specific. And we also want to make sure it's not the best thing is for the boss's boss. So it's any company, if I'm sitting there, if I'm at um, um, Sherman in Elgin, Illinois, and a manager sends a note to Linda Deering, who's the chief operating officer, and the nurse gets a note from Linda Deering saying, I got this from your manager, it's going to have a bigger impact. Also, I found as a senior leader getting these notes on who I should write to I learned a bunch of things. Somebody told me to write somebody to this, write a note to this person because they did this on the unit. I said, well, if we're doing that on this unit, why don't we do it on all the units? So it's also a great way to learn about process improvement. So don't underestimate, again, the thank you note and what it can do to an individual. And remember, according to Gallup research, it takes three positives to one negative to have a positive relationship with someone. And I believe a thank, handwritten thank you note or a specific thank you note might actually give you all three with one action. Kathy, next slide. The next thing I want to talk about is really mentoring. Because we have found in our work that we're, we're finding that organizations are so rushed that they really don't get a chance to create that mentoring relationship early on. And 27% of people that leave an organization leave within the first 90 days, and 50% leave within the first year, and 80% leave within five years. So really that first 90 days is important. Again, we want to tell every new employee we're going to have these meetings so they're not scared. And the supervisor basically says, how do we compare to what we said? What's working well? Has there been any individuals that have been helpful to you? That gets them seeing positive and also gets us being able to compliment. Based on your prior work, what ideas for improvement do you have, which is that process improvement. You know, I see Dave Fox at Advocate Good Samaritan. We have many people on Advocate, which just named one of the health leaders, top 20 leaders. And this is an area that he talks about a lot on their Baldrige journey, is really harvesting ideas from the workforce. Ask them what they think could be do differently, which then tells them we want solutions. Um, also, is there any reason you would feel this is the, not the right place for you? Then the 90th day, you ask the same questions, but you also then go into two additional questions. If you are recruiting, if you're not, don't ask it. 
Do you know anyone else who would be a good fit for our organization? And as your supervisor, how can I help you? What we've done now is not only have we reduced turnover at Studer Group because we give a money back guarantee and we have to look at always return on investment financial impact, one of the ways we can show a financial impact is to take an organization's turnover, show how if it's reduced 66% what that means to an organization, not only in just orientation cost and drug screening cost, but it also in agency cost, but it really can also tie into length of stay, because again, an experienced staff will move a patient through quicker, including billing, anything, just experience pays off in healthcare. It also tells them that I'm looking for solutions, I want to know who to recognize, I'm concerned, which ties into the concern, is this the right fit, and, and I want your input on, one, what we can do better, and anyone else who might fit, and I'm telling you, I want to be helpful to you. So we have really found mentoring has become a lost in this whole healthcare craze. And we believe that mentoring is just as important as formal training in any healthcare organization. So now let's look at the, so we covered three tools. We covered the rounding, the reward and recognition thank you note, that 30 and 90 day meetings. So I'm really, really trying to give the bang for the buck on this webinar. And we have found at Studer Group that organizations try to do too much. There's only, if you do two things at a time, according to Franklin Covey, you're more likely to be successful. Anything you do after that almost drops it in half. Most of the work we do at Studer Group is intervention. Somebody's trying to do this on their own. One of the first things we do is slow them down, show them by doing fewer things, they get a bigger impact. So please, I'm not even seeing, saying you take all of these. Just take one or two and do it always, and you're going to find much greater impact. So let's go to our last tip and tool today. This is something brand new that many of you have not seen. We started it about a year ago because what we found out is dealing with challenging work situations is so hard on people in healthcare, they might avoid it. They might even blame themselves for problems with the situation. When we go around and we do a lot of research, we find out that any most organizations we work with will say about 8% of their current workforce are not meeting performance expectations. We find about 50% of the 8% have no documentation. So if you're a 1,000 employee organization, that means that you've got 80 employees that are really dragging the organization down. But see, it's not just 80. Those 80 impact the other 920. Um, working in, with the dentist, I had a great story one time where they, they had a nurse quit in the OB unit. And after that, they called nurses to come in, and they all came in. And they realized that the, one of the questions the nurses used to always ask is who's working. And if they heard this individual's name, they always came up with the reason not to show up. So that 8% it really impacts more than just the 8%, but it means out of 1,000, you have 80, and out of 40 of them, they don't even know that they're not meeting expectations, which certainly isn't value-driven. Now, we work with 40% of our organizations have unions. This isn't a union problem. This isn't an HR problem. It's a documentation problem and a feedback challenge that we find healthcare organizations need. So how do you get people to do this difficult thing because we're relationship people. We see that problem employ, but we also know they're a divorced mother with three children. We see that problem employ, we also know that they might not be able to get another job. We see that problem employ, we know they got a child in college. We're so relationship oriented, this is really hard. So what we do is we have organizations rank how value driven they are, because that is really, to me, the, 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 the integrity DNA that most healthcare people have as our values. The average healthcare organizations that we survey ranks their values as an eight, somewhere between a seven, five, and an eight, but closer to an eight. Kathy, next slide. Well, here we go. Now we say, well, rank your dealing with performance issues. And we explain a 10 is, you know, you, like everybody has them. You deal with them, give them feedback, put them on a corrective action plan, give them coaching. If they do it, fine. But if they don't do it, you remove them from the organization. A one is not only do we have low performers, but we hired all their low performing relatives so they're not lonely. Well, the average here is somewhere between a four and a five. And it's normally about three of the numerical points away from the values. Then what we tell organizations is you cannot be any more value driven than this number. Because if you're not 
raising this number up to your value number, what that says to all the employees that are not problematic is you're going to, I'm going to force you to work with people you shouldn't have to work with because we don't have the skill set to deal with them, which unfortunately will allow us not to be successful in today's changing healthcare environment. And even worse, it will cause us to harm and hurt patients that don't need to be harmed and hurt. Kathy, next slide. So we can't teach in, in a one-hour webinar how to do this, except some tips. Number one is everybody's going to have the categories. And the good news is, by far, 92% of the people are what we call either high performers or middle. And lately, we've been calling middle, middle or solid performers. Kathy, next slide. It's really important as you go through here to realize that when you do any change, and we're going to be changing all the time now with the healthcare environment accelerating the external environment, that we're going to be OK for a while because the low performers will not be so noticeable because they're pretty covert early on because they don't plan on the change staying. They plan on that leader going. They don't think you can keep it up. I did my first employee forum when I was president of a hospital. The first note I got was, this is nice. I'm sure you're just doing this to make a good first impression. You'll probably never do this again. Well, I sent out the whole year schedule then the next day just to put that one to bed. So you're going to have the low performers are going to sort of be laying there waiting for this thing to fail. And then we get to a point where we're feeling really good. John Cotter says one of the mistakes in cultural transformations, we declare victory too soon. We start feeling good, you know. And it doesn't have to be student or group. It could be the lean is the greatest thing that ever sliced bread. The bald journey is spectacular. Magnet is the most beautiful thing that ever happened. Um, our new electronic health record is going to solve all our issues. None of us will, and this includes student group. We're all in this together. Everything I mentioned is good, but what we find is unless we deal with the performance issue, it'll sabotage every good thing we're doing in healthcare because we won't get the process improvement and the cost reduction we need and the high clinical quality we have to have in a transparent world if we don't deal with the low performer. And we can't be a low performance challenge. It has to be a value challenge. Because we hold up the mirror and say it's a value driven, healthcare people will make the tough decision if they know it's about values and being loyal to all those other people that are not causing problems. Kathy, next slide. So what happens is we go down. And so what we do a lot at Studer Group, and Kathy, next slide is we show people how to get over this. We meet with the high performer. You go to our website. You'll see all sorts of this. We tell them where the organization's going. We thank them for their work. We outline why they're so important, and we ask them what we can do for them. They'll ask for either more opportunity, more training, or more responsibility. What excites high performers like the many high performers on this phone call? Getting better. More opportunity, more responsibility, even more training. Next slide. Kathy, next slide. Then we move to the middle performer conversation. And we then we don't get hung up in you're a middle, you're a high. I would just basically say, we're having whoop, go back to the middle, please, Kathy. Back up a slide. If we just want to hear, make sure the person feels less anxious. They're nervous. There's a lot of change going on. They're wondering if they're going to be able to make it. We have to reconnect them back to us. And we want to hold on to the solid performer by telling them that we want to keep them by telling them we're here to coach them. Again, Harvard says the number one driver is they want feedback and investment. We're here to invest in you. Let me tell you your good qualities. Let me talk about our commitment to your development and what we're going to do. And let me close again with all these good affirming qualities. Now the next one, Kathy. Then we go to those difficult conversations. Number one, I recommend that you get a lot of training in it. We have a lot of our speakers that go out around the country and do this. We want to make sure that people are prepared. We want to make sure they don't feel judged, because most are going to wish they had done it sooner, wish they had better, um, you know, better results, wish they had better impact, and so on. We want to basically sit down with the person after practicing, describe what we've been observing, tell them what policy or procedure by evaluating what policy and procedure has not been followed, show them what needs to be done, because they're going to say, I don't know. And we owe it to them that 50% of the people we've never given feedback to 
let them know the consequences of the same performance, and they let them know that we're going to follow up to see they hit expectations but they're no longer in the organization. Kathy, next slide. So what we're really trying to do is to engage the employees to help us get over the wall. And what's that wall? Well, the hard part is the wall is going to keep going up. We're faced with an industry that if we're making 2% operating margin, it's going to be a 16% loss in the next eight to nine years. So that wall is going to keep going up. It's like an es escalator. We're going to have to keep moving with it. And that means we're going to have to get better and better and better. And that's why I think we have to do things like the Becker Healthcare webinar here, which continues to engage people who wants to improve their skill set. Kathy, last slide. So really talking about is moving performance. And you can't move performance if you don't engage the workforce. Which brings it back to the last slide, Kathy, that I'm going to talk about, then I'm open up for questions. Is bring it back to values. And that's really what this is all about. It's all about not what happened yesterday, because yesterday's gone. It's, hey, I'm out here learning, and if we connect employee engagement to clinical outcomes, if we take employee engagement as something that's hard, not soft, that improves performance, allows us to continue to meet our mission as a healthcare provider by getting better in tough economic times, engaged employees will be better able to reduce costs because they don't do workarounds and they own, and most importantly, engaged employees will improve performance. And getting rid of unengaged employees is the only fair thing to do to our patients, our physicians, our engaged employees. Those are values as much as anything that has to do with performance. So I'd love to um, get some questions if possible. Kathy? Well, thank you, Mr. Studer. That was very informative and enjoyable. Um, we will now begin the Q&A portion of the program. As a reminder, you can submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Mr. Studer will attempt to answer as many questions as he can during the time we have for Q&A and will follow up on questions he does not have the opportunity to address. Um, I have, one of the questions was long-term care. I think these tools actually work better in long-term care. I think in long-term care, you, you, you have a lot of turnover. And I'm not saying the person who wrote the question, but you have a, long, a, lot of long, a lot of turnover. Yet when you look at residents, let's say for this case, we'll say residents in a long-term care facility, their family members really create a relationship with those caregivers. So anything we can do to reduce turnover in the long-term care is something that's going to really improve the resident satisfaction and, as, as importantly, the, um, the family satisfaction. So I think it really resonates with, um, with the long-term care. Another question okay, I had, you. we can get a copy of these slides. I would think it's fine with us, Kathy. How about you? Yes, um, we, we have a staff member that will answer those questions. You have the copy of the slides and presentation will be available a few days after the seminar, or the webinar, sorry. Right. Um, um, we do have a few questions coming in. Um, love it. I'm reading them here. Do you want me to just go through them, or do you want to ask them as you get them, Kathy? Well, I will, whatever is easiest for you. I mean, Go ahead, just to ask them. As, I think you might see them quicker. Just ask me and we'll go through as many as we can. That sounds great. The first one I have here is what is the best way to get doctors on board? Um, well, first of all, doctors might think they're on board. They might think the problem is the hospital's not on board. So I think it's really doing that diagnostic tool with the physicians to find out really where they're at. There's we do a lot of work. My, my last two years has been spent an awful lot of time in this whole physician element, particularly creating feedback mechanisms because only one in five physicians get any feedback on their performance from an organization. So I would say there's four things you have to do with doctors. Number one, make sure outside of diagnosing it is in Rochester, we have on our website some work with Mark Clement did up in Rochester on working with the medical staff that's just excellent to show how they did it using a, a physician satisfaction survey. But number one is make sure the quality of care is there. Physicians want that quality of care. Not only do you want need to address it, address it with them, that's just something we can all agree on, in fact, I was 
talking to Linda Deering again at Sherman, and she was talking about how over the years their physicians have come aboard. And I know we got IU Health, who's done a really nice job with that. That also, yes, everybody on the that I've seen that I know that's a client of ours does a nice job with it. Quality of care. Number two, it's input. Physicians want input. Whether they're employed or they're independent, they want input, yet many of them have no input when I go to an organization and say, do you know, where, where do you put your patients? And they'll tell me, you know, what floor, or I'm a surgeon. I'll say, do you know how your manager is being evaluated? No idea, never seen it. One of the things right off the bat is to make sure you take your physicians and show them how the leaders are being evaluated in an organization as this makes sense to them because this is going to lock in their, their input. We used to run focus groups and always ask what's going well and one thing we can do better. On our website we have something called the quadrant exercise which helps you put doctors into various quadrants and gives you a, a diagnostic plan and a treatment plan for each quadrant. The th third thing doctors want, and these all work together like a circle, is they want efficiency and effectiveness. You know, we want physicians to be on board. We've got to make sure that we're meeting their needs. If, if you know, one of the airlines that I fly wanted me to be a loyal flyer, it'd be nice if they didn't lose my luggage, nice if they treated me nice, and it'd even be good if they stayed on time. Well, if we look at doctors, doctors are many times like a passenger going to take a flight. They're getting to the hospital or the clinic based on something supposed to happen at a certain time, yet they hear delays. And I think delays and ineffectiveness and not having the right tools or equipment, 49% of ORs that start late start because the doctor's there and the patient is not ready for the incision. The other 49, and then there's another 2%, some other means is because the patient's ready and the doctor's not there. But if you ask each side, they're all waiting for the other side to change before they change. So it's really diagnosing what the issue is and being effective and efficient. And another key point is truly recognizing doctors. Do not think because doctors do such great work that they're overly recognized. Doctors are sitting there every day reading that the government's going to cut their reimbursement by 30%. They're reading every day about they're not going to be paid for this, this, and that. They're reading every day that things are changing, but they're still judged on a productivity model or their collections. So that if the hospital is overwhelmed with the sense of change, times that by about four, and you have your physicians. So I think it's really making sure that you're sitting down, quality of care, effectiveness and efficiency, input, reward and recognition, and also doing a diagnostic tool. We sat with the Children's Hospital in um, Orange County not too long ago, and we went through their top doctors and actually went through a quadrant exercise on who's with us, who could be with us, who may be with us, and who's probably never going to be with us. And it was very, very healthy. And even the senior executive team didn't agree. So make sure the senior executive team's on board with that. Sorry to go on so long with this question, but physicians are really our sweet spot right now at the Studio Group. We're doing a a lot of good work in that with creating one tools for senior leaders to better meet their needs and really tools to give physicians feedback. When physicians see the data, they will change their behavior, probably more so than any other stakeholder in the healthcare environment. Kathy, um, next question. Sure, I have a question. Uh, what if your boss is a low performer? That's the number one question that I um, get. And um, I think those are mostly, was that someone that worked at the student group that reports to me? Could you um, check that out? Would Jackie Neese write that question? Anyway, I think in, in my book, I go into great detail on that, the Great Employee Handbook. And the key point I hit is, number one, before we judge someone else, hold up our own mirror. Are we really doing everything we can be? Because how can we talk about someone else being a low performer if we have performance issues ourselves. Number two, when you look at your boss, start recognizing what's good. The compliment, because recognized behavior gets repeated. Then in the book, I have how to have conversations with your boss, which is sort, sort of the cup of coffee conversation, which where you say things is such as, this is my perception. You say things as, if you notice this, you probably wouldn't be doing it. Because I think reality is, you have to give people an exit. And if I say to the boss, if you notice this, I'm sure, you, if you noticed in scheduling, they kept scheduling me on weekends, I'm sure you wouldn't do it. They may say, gee, I'm sorry. 
And then, of course, if you, when you read my book, The Great Employee Handbook, I get to the real serious point of um, there are times when you have to have that serious conversation, more serious, that says, gee, if this doesn't change, I'm going to have to make a decision. And even though it's so hard today, hey, life's too short to keep yourself working for someone that sucks the life and energy out of you. But I hope when people read the book, they can find tools and techniques will help actually improve that relationship so they don't have to leave an organization and put their family through a move situation. Kathy? Thank you. Um, how do you sequence the high, middle, and low performer conversations? Always, well, always, if, always start with your high because it's really retention. These, I wouldn't call these low performer conversations as much as retention conversations. We want to get our highs first because we want to get them with us. Then we want to move to our solid because we want them to feel great. Remember, the low performer is trying to influence that, not the high performer because they know they can't, but they'll go to that middle or solid performer and try to create a we-they. So we got to get them with us. We find that if you do the, the high and middles first, there are some low conversations you don't even need to have because those people are already leaving the organization. So it's get all your highs done, get all your middles done, and then start your lows. Thank you. Um, here's a question for you. What do you suggest for an organization where leadership strongly feels employee engagement is not important? It's sad, because what they're going to find out is going to happen is they're not going to be a player in healthcare. Because, I mean, when I look at what people are doing, they're trying to put electronic health record in. How can you do that without engaged employees? They're trying to look for cost cutting. Well, employees are the ones that know where the waste is. And number three, they're trying to look at process improvement to reduce cost. You're going to have to have an engaged workforce. So I, I just find that, unfortunately, these are organizations that are being led by people that I think are not going to lead them into what we believe is a good future, and unfortunately, um, patients are the one that pay the price, and employees pay the price. So it's a sad situation. I just don't think those individuals in senior leadership roles will last much longer. Thank you. Um, we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, how do you objectively measure employee engagement on a leader evaluation? You do a survey tool, and now it's usually once a year but you can do many ones with questions. So for example, um, I will tell you at Studer Group, you know, we have all our senior leaders are measured on employee engagement. So for example, a Debbie Ritchie, who's an operations leader, might have 30% of her evaluation. I own a minor league baseball team, the Pensacola Blue Wahoos with the Cincinnati Reds, and Bruce Baldwin's the president of our organization, and 30% of his evaluation is based on employee engagement, a survey done once a year. Now, we also monitor it, and we do them on a consistent basis, many surveys, and it's wonderful. We work with an academic medical center that had a department chair, a physician who really wasn't too mo motivated or focused on employees. He, well, you looked at his evaluation, he never had it on there. So you take the diagnostic tool, you put that diagnostic tool as the measurement tool, you put what score you're looking for, you put what weight, which is the prioritization, and that becomes it. Watch how quick people align their behavior to how they're being evaluated, specifically if it means they could lose their job if they don't improve their performance. Thank you, Mr. Studer. I have a question from an attendee who says, the challenge I run into is moving out low performers when I have been unable to recruit replacements to fill those positions. For example, Physical therapists are in very short supply in this area. Can you comment on the best way to manage this type of situation? Yes. I think, um, I don't know if they've done it. I find sometimes the reason we can't recruit the next one is because they don't want to work with the current one. I think also you have to have that conversation with the senior executive team. For example, I was talking to Lori, last name I won't say, from the system I won't say. I was talking to her a couple weeks ago and she said she was afraid to remove a low performer because their system was tightening up and you couldn't replace people that left. And I said, well, you can't rationalize that. You've got to sit down with senior leaders and say, um, we might have some additional cost, whether it's an agency, a locum tenum, um, for a while. 
But if we don't have these extra costs, here's the downside of not dealing with this low performer issue. Had an organization in a small community that thought, well, we'll never recruit another pharmacist. Well, the problem is the pharmacists there had such a reputation, no one ever wanted to go work with them. This is the hardest question we have in this, is you've got to have the leap of faith. And if you move them out, I have found over and over again, that idea, I can't find anyone, will take care of itself, because you will find someone, because they'll want to come work for an environment where they don't have to work with people that are difficult. But you've got to have that heart-to-heart -heart with your senior leader, saying things could get worse expense-wise, but in the long run, they're going to be much better. Okay, thank you. We have time for just one more question, and that is, what is the total time frame in which HML conversations should be completed? Well, it depends. At Inova, it was 14 months because they had like 12,000 employees. So it really depends on the size of the organization. Um, in some, you can go much quicker. Um, so it really depends on the size. It depends on how many. And that's where I think, you know, it really always hits me and unusual is that when people get revenue cycle or supply chain management or process improvement or electronic health record, they're very likely to go out and hire an outside resource to help them. Yet when it comes to what I'm talking about, when people say to me, Quinn, who's your biggest competitor in this? I say, it's really organizations trying to do it themselves. And usually they don't work well because this is so dang hard. So what we would do is go in and actually sit down with the senior leadership team look at the number of people they have, look at the number in each category, and walk them through um, probably what's the best timeline to do that. So there's just no cookie cutter approach to this. Well, thank you, Mr. Studer, for your excellent presentation and for all of you attendees who participated today. We look forward to having you join us again for future webinars. This will conclude today's program. And everyone have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you to Becker Healthcare for putting this on and all those friends out there that I saw on the name list that took time to listen today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.